I think a lot of people feel more comfortable believing that racism is something that happened in the past. What we hear on an almost daily basis from the First Nations people and communities that we serve is that racism is alive and well. Racism has been understood to be part of the uh, implications of uh, health service delivery and of the outcomes of health service delivery by First Nations people uh, really for many, many years. Examples of that could be uh, when a First Nations person shows up in an emergency room and the automatic assumption is that they are under the influence of either alcohol or some type of uh, substance. The reality is that uh, a high number of uh, First Nations people are highly abstinent uh, from all alcohol and drugs. So when you're treated with the example of um, how often do you use alcohol and when was the last time you used alcohol and are you sure, then that becomes quite, um, quite insulting uh, and quite uh, disconcerting. Practitioners uh, are very unwilling uh, to consider that the person may want traditional healing uh, parts of ceremony or culture included as part of the treatment plan for their health concern. And so people often leave that situation feeling that they haven't been heard, uh, that they don't have many options available to them, uh, and of course then they don't receive the standard of care that any other person would receive. One of the reasons why we have gaps in health status, different measures of health status, is because people are reluctant to seek care because they know personally of someone who has been treated or mistreated or untreated in the healthcare system due to racism. And so you would have, uh, you know, people going to the doctor who were in stage, you know, two or three or even four, um, stage four cancer, you know, having hesitated or waited and waited until they could wait no longer to seek health care. It's only been probably a matter of weeks since I experienced a racist incident myself. So it happens all the time. And that's why it's so important that we continue to work extremely hard to eliminate it uh, from the health system. In order to actually achieve cultural safety, we had to have an instrument to operationalize or to give health organizations some concrete ideas and actions as to how they could start on their own cultural safety journey. I think standards need to be formalized because you need to have a minimum requirement of great health care no matter where you go in the system, whether you're going to your physician's office, to an urgent primary care center or the emergency or long-term care. There should be standards of care that are expected across the board, whether you're a nurse, whether you're a doctor, whether you're an LPN. People should be expected to receive excellent care and they need to be held accountable if they're not delivering that care. It was really important that we conducted ourselves in a, in a cultural way in developing the standards. So we opened every meeting with a song and some ceremony. So before I went to the first meeting, I looked up the meaning standard in a dictionary. It actually refers to a flag that the army would call, carry onto the field of battle. And they'd all rally around that flag. So when I went to the meeting, my first meeting, I said, we're, we're developing a document that people can rally around in this war against racism. 
So the two key partners were, of course, First Nations Health Authority and the different people, individuals involved in cultural safety and humility across the organization and the health standards organization. So they have a lot of experience in developing different kinds of standards. The cultural safety and humility standard is the first of its kind in Canada. And it really represents an important step in the journey of addressing Indigenous specific racism and discrimination. The standard was developed by a 16 person Indigenous led technical committee, individuals with really diverse perspectives and experience that looked at evidence and research and reports from Indigenous scholars and academics bringing together all the perspectives and ideas about how to shape the environment for care that is culturally safe for all. We did use a distinctions-based approach because every, uh, you know, large group, First Nations, Métis, Inuit, has different health concerns at times, different priorities, different ways of looking at cultural safety and approaching their health. A really critical step in the development of the standard is the public review process. And that involves putting out the draft of the standard to the public to read, respond to, provide their ideas. And in this instance, over 1,000 people from coast to coast to coast responded to that call for input. And the technical committee did amazing work of reviewing all of that and incorporating it along with other evidence and experience into the final version of the standard. So it truly represents all voices. The actual standard is a document, a roadmap that health and social service organizations in British Columbia could take and start to work uh, on their cultural safety and humility journey if they hadn't already as a means to eliminating anti-Indigenous specific racism. What we see is that not every jurisdiction takes the, uh, the issue of um, uh, racism in the health system uh, seriously or accepts it. So I would say, first of all, it's uh, making sure that uh, this is understood as a real problem in the health system, but then also really sets a path to really address those shortcomings and deficiencies. So the standard is like a mirror and you look at yourself and you can start to make statements of accountability of harm we've done and we're going to stop that. There are eight different domains in the standard, including uh, areas such as health leadership and governance, uh, health human resources, the actual services that are provided. And under each of those domains, there are a set of criteria that as I said, organizations can aim for, and under each criteria is a set of guidelines uh, for how uh, that can be achieved. I think for me, making it a national standard would be wonderful. I think our province of British Columbia is actually quite ahead when it comes to cultural safety and humility. I think we could learn from other areas and communities as well. However, I think as a whole, it would be great if Canada adopted this standard. First Nations people across Canada suffer the same disparity that we do here in British Columbia. And so having such a strong standard um, being built here we, you know, would potentially serve the rest of Canada. And so it's vital that we look at ways to build on the learnings and experience from here, apply those in a way that can help ensure culturally safe care everywhere. I think part of what we need to really uh, uh, foster is a sense of hope 
and it, and that that sense of hope is built on very specific and concrete steps. And so moving the standard from a BC standard to a national standard, I think would be really important and ultimately uh, would contribute to better health outcomes for First Nations, Métis and Inuit people across the country. I tell people the winds of change are here. Some of you might just feel a small little breeze, but it's here. <laughs>